Hi everybody, welcome to ABTV. I'm Ali Beg. As I look back on Aberdeen's much needed victory against Dundee at Pataudry on Saturday. Now let me start today's show with a little bit of an apology. We attempted yesterday to stream this show live. Unfortunately, we got hit with gremlins and we just couldn't get it to you. So I do apologise for that. This is a recorded show, but I hope it doesn't take away any fun and enjoyment. Talking of YouTube, I just want to take this opportunity to thank all of you who have recently subscribed to my new channel and to literally the thousands of you who watched the debut show ahead of the Dundee game on Saturday. I am very, very grateful. So thank you. Coming up a little bit later, North Sound Radio's sports editor Dave Galloway is chewing the fat about the game against Dundee. And we'll get a fan's perspective as well from Gary from ABZ Podcast who offers us his thoughts. Now today is a very special day in the calendar of Aberdeen Football Club's history. Look out for a very special interview coming up a little bit later. But come on, let's get stuck into Saturday's game against Dundee. Let's start with the match stats. 56% possession. 19 shots overall, only of which five were on target. 10 off target, and during the 90 minutes, we only won six corners. Jim Goodwin said, all that mattered was the result. He's absolutely spot on. This is what it means. We now automatically can't get relegated, but with three games left, we can still get dragged into the relegation playoff. But the general consensus when I was looking online is that most of us think we are good. Next game, Hibs on Saturday at Easter Road. Then on Gothenburg Day, of all days, we travel through to Perth to play St Johnston at McDermott Park. And we finish our campaign at Petaudry against St Mirren on the 15th. What's the least we can expect? To be honest, I'm hoping for nine points out of nine. I think it's really important to finish the season on a high. And for Jim Goodwin to go into the summer knowing what he needs to do to rebuild this squad. I think it's really important for confidence as well. It just puts a feel factor, a good feel factor, around the club, around the fans, around the players, around the coaching staff. Nine points out of nine. Here's hoping. Okay, how many of you know Scott Baxter, freelance sports photographer? Scott has very kindly offered me the use of his images from Saturday's game. You can follow him on social media. And please check out his fabulous website where you can actually buy images from him. This was Lewis Ferguson's penalty, 11th goal of the season. He actually was named as man of the match on the day. The BBC named Johnny Hayes as their man of the match. But for me, this was our man of the match. I thought Joe was absolutely superb on the day. He made four or five vital saves, which I think kept us in the game. The gaffer was also delighted. He had plenty to say after the game, including making a point about how important Joe's saves were. But at the end of the day, he did say the most important thing was for us to get the results. We're not going to celebrate it because of the position that we are in the league. Very interesting thoughts coming from Jim Goodwin in his post-match interview on Aberdeen's in online channel, as well as the written press in the... Post, post-match press conference. Right, so let's have a quick look and see how you guys responded online. Christian Ramirez, who was a second-half substitute, he tweeted, plus three and an emoji, Calvin Ramsey, who Jim Goodwin has come out and said, one of the best fullbacks in the world. A lot of speculation about him at the moment. Plus three and a clean sheet. This always makes me laugh. I don't know why. Don's Daily, the old cliche, a win and a clean sheet if Carlsberg did Saturdays. Our pals from ABZ tweeted they were particularly gushing about Jack McKenzie's performance. I thought Jack was great as well. And Pye and Bovril, who's an influential tweeter over on Twitter, he said, massive relief at Pataudry yesterday as Aberdeen finally got the win that pretty much assured their premiership place for another season. OK, what about the newspapers? How did they respond? Sean Wallace, a brilliant journalist from the Press and Journal, after relief of all but killing off relegation playoff danger comes reality of the extent of the rebuild needed. I like what the Evening Express do after the game. They get the fans involved. You guys have been interactive here and so many of you made a special mention about Joe's performance. 
in the Scotsman, no high fiving, says Aberdeen manager Jim Goodwin after win against Dundee. He also went on to explain the contentious Christian Ramirez substitution and clear up all the rumours that were going about online that Christian is set to leave the club at the end of the season. Right, as promised, let's now introduce our first guest. I caught up with North Sound's sports editor Dave Galloway to look back on Saturday's game against Dundee and this is what he had to hey, say. Thanks so much for joining me. Let's get straight into it. So, give us your general thoughts on Saturday's game. Uh, I would say, Ali, uh, th thanks very much for having me on, by the way. Great to be Pleasure. here. Pleasure. Um, overall, the game... Not bad. It had its moments, I thought. You know, Aberdeen very nearly scoring after uh, four seconds or so uh, with that, that outrageous effort from from Ferguson. And that certainly had the fans on side from the, the first whistle. Then a few minutes later, Bissawan, I thought he was really lively all afternoon, by the way, um, showed great skill at the byline. He was uh, really tangling there with, uh, with Marshall. Marshall was all over him like a rash. He wriggled clear, put a beautiful ball across, and then uh, Ramirez just couldn't get a touch. And that was all within the first 10 minutes or so. And I think we all thought, yeah, Aberdeen are going to do okay today. But then something something happened and Dundee just took over. And for me, overall, Dundee were the, the better side in the first half. And that, that was worrying at the interval. I actually said on the big Saturday football show on Saturday, Dave, that I felt we were lucky to go in at nil-nil at halftime. I thought they could have been 3-0 up if it wasn't for Joe Lewis, who made three outstanding saves. So, yeah. I, I don't know. What do you think went wrong? Um, well, Dundee appeared to get after Aberdeen, didn't they? They pressed them very well. They hustled and they, they harried. They got in Aberdeen's faces. I don't know if Aberdeen didn't expect that, but you know that almost resulted in a in a goal uh, for for Dundee. Ferguson lost the ball, um, and they, they they could have been a couple of goals up um, at half time at least, or or three goals, two or three goals, quite easily. Um, yeah, Ferguson Ferguson gave the ball away, and then um, Big Joe Lewis he made a fantastic save. It was from uh, Mullen. Uh, finger tipping that ball to safety, and you know he really dug the Dons out of a big, big hole in that uh, first half. He also had a another uh, couple of good saves. There was um, there was the effort from just a, a few yards. It was like Bagatelle in the box, wasn't it? And then uh, McGowan stuck out a toe, couldn't get anything on it, but you know Lewis was in the right place at the right time. And then there was that nice move with the. Uh, McGinn going down the left, crossing uh, the ball in, and then uh, McMullen just um, getting on the end of that one. A very good save by by Lewis there. It could all have easily gone very wrong there, couldn't it? Mm. It's interesting because I actually I said again on the Big Saturday Football Show that Lewis Ferguson was given the sponsors' man of the match. I noticed on the BBC website that Johnny Hayes was given their man of the match. I thought Johnny was outstanding actually on Saturday. But for me, I would have personally, I would have chosen Joe Lewis quite simply because he kept us in the game and because it was almost like he was back to the old Joe Lewis. I thought he was great on Saturday. Yeah, I, I thought I thought he certainly was. He was he was really playing the, the, the captain's part. And the big man has had a lot of critics, um, a lot of criticism coming his way this season. Some of it way over the top. Some of it maybe justified because I think the big man would admit that his, his form has definitely dipped but that he really grabbed the bull by the horns and he he inspired Aberdeen with that uh, performance in the first half and it gave Aberdeen um, a bit of breathing space and then at half time let's be uh, complimentary and rightly so to the manager you know what whatever Jim Goodwin said at half time it certainly worked because Aberdeen were much better in the second half much better the pace was a lot better, and you know they, they got after Dundee. They, they, they were ni nice, nice and crisp, and they just looked like they had a, a more of a spring in their step. 
yeah. Okay, last question, just to finish off. I know, obviously, now we can't finish bottom, so we can't be automatically relegated, but still not quite safe from the playoff zone. But do you think we've done enough? I think Aberdeen are safe in, in, in all but name. You know, you, you really can't see them throwing it away now. Um, I mean, although it's been a dreadful season and the, uh, the, the, the self-confidence and the performances have been, uh, you know, really worrying for large parts of the season. Surely not even Aberdeen could throw this one away. Eight points ahead of St. Johnson, only nine points on the table. There's something far wrong with Aberdeen throwing away. No, I, I think they're, they're pretty much safe. I'm not a gambling man, but if I was, I would bet a few quid that Aberdeen would be safe. What they have to do now, finish the season with a flourish if they can try and you know pick something positive from what has been a very very poor season Aberdeen's poorest season for you know for many a year it's been a terrible campaign it's got to be another three wins that has to be the target let's you know end the season from an Aberdeen perspective on a on a, on a positive um you know to go into the summer with a bit of a high if that's at all possible it's it's a huge summer ahead for Jim Goodwin isn't it you know the Big, big rebuilding job, isn't it, Ali? You know, Ferguson and Ramsey will almost certainly leave. Constein is on his way. Other players that the manager simply doesn't have in his plans, they'll be gone as well. But remember, it's going to be a very short summer, isn't it? Because we've got the pre-season friendlies will be back again in June because the season begins again on July the 2nd with the, the League Cup uh, group stage games. So... You know, Jim Goodwin is not going to have any any summer holiday at all, I don't think. Yeah. Dave, brilliant. Thank you so much for joining me today. Really Thanks appreciated out. your efforts. And I'll see you very soon. Thanks, mate. All the best. Thank you. Cheers. Here we go. Sports editor from North Sound Radio. Dave Galloway, who's going to be a regular contributor to this show. You can follow him on social media. He is on Instagram, Dave Galloway 1983. Give him a follow. Dave's a great lad. Okay, let's get a fan's perspective now on the game against Dundee. If you want to get involved, drop me a line on my social media channels. You can get involved on Twitter, on my Ali Beg official Facebook page as well. Just drop me a note. And if you want to come on and be part of the show, I'd love to have you on. But no bad language. Rule number one. It's the only rule I have. No bad language, please. Okay, let's now get the thoughts of Gary from ABZ Podcast. We spoke yesterday about the game. This is what he had to say. Hey, Gary, let's get stuck straight into it. Good win. A big win. Important to get it. But overall, what were your thoughts? It was what we said. It was a must win, wasn't it? So... Getting the win was the most important thing. It's what Jim Goodwin said after the game as well on, on Saturday afternoon. I mean, it wasn't much of a performance to write home about. It's fair to say. First half especially, I'm sure we'll come on to it. But hey, the most important thing was getting the three points on the board, especially given the result at, um, at Perth as well in the afternoon. I thought we played so much better in the second half than we did in the first half. At one point in the first half, I was thinking, we're just at sixes and sevens. We're all over the shop here. After making such a bright start as well. Yeah, opening five, ten minutes, I thought, here we go. Like, because we'd switched to the 4 4 2. Um, I thought we looked dangerous. I mean, there was almost that statement of intent from Ferguson where he just takes a shot straight from kickoff and you think, brilliant. You get Dundee penned into the box a little bit for the opening first five, ten minutes. And then we got sucked into doing what we've done every time we've played Dundee this season. We let Charlie Adam start to dictate the game in the centre of the park. And Listen, it's not, there's no sense of hyperbole by saying we could have easily been 2 0 down going in at half time. Yeah, I, funny enough, I said exactly the same thing. I said it to, to Dave Galloway earlier today as well. We could have gone in 3 0 down at half time, but for Joe Lewis, who I thought personally was absolutely fantastic on the day. Yeah, I mean, we spoke about, we recorded the next episode of the pod last night and we were kind of talking about that, that this is, I think actually in the last few weeks, Joe's started to look more like the Joe Lewis. Of old, I think there was definitely a question mark about his confidence, etc. Earlier in the season, but the two saves, especially he makes the first half, were back to the Joe Lewis of old. It saves us, like you say, from going in two 0 potentially three 0 down at half time. And if if that happened, you know, I think the fans did well on Saturday. I think the fans kind of stuck with the team, despite the fact the first half was poor. If we'd gone in 
two 0 down. I mean, that could have turned pretty mm. talks. I think it's fair to say. Mm. Um, just a little thing on uh, Jack McKenzie. So I, I, I read with interest the newspaper reports about you know all the injuries that he's had and the hell that he's gone through recently. I thought Jack looked great on Saturday. Really did. Very positive performance. Yeah, I mean, I think Jack's one of these guys. I've I've been saying for a little while now that I think we have to give him the benefit of the doubt for this season because I thought he started brightly. I think there was definitely question marks about his defensive capabilities early in the season, but you could have said the same about Calvin Ramsey and I felt that the two of them were not necessarily being helped out early in the season by the way we were setting up to play and they, they seemed like the obvious weak links in our lineup at the time. But then, like as you say, he's had some horrendous injuries um, since October time, basically. I know he came back at the side around the kind of Christmas time briefly and then was straight back out again. So, yeah, I was dead pleased to see him. I thought actually last week against Livingston, I thought Jack played okay as well. But I thought on I thought on Saturday against Dundee, I thought he was excellent. And hopefully he can kind of now keep himself fit, get a good kind of pre-season under his yeah. belt yeah. and come back stronger and looking forward. And then nothing else you know, for a lot of the young players, I think Jack spoke about this in the press as well, as bad as the season has been, in a weird way for a lot of the young kids, what a massive learning curve for them and their maiden season. They're only going to be stronger for having gone through that kind of adversity as well, potentially. Mm. Okay, so St. Johnston next. Uh, sorry, Hibs away. Hibs next, yeah. St. Johnston next after that. And then we finish off with St. Mimin at Pataudry, early kickoff. So yep. what's the least we can expect? Well, they know. I mean, the thing is, Hibs, like us, will just be waiting for the season to finish now. They've had a horrendous season. So, I mean, that game could be anything, I think, on mm. Saturday. Who really knows what that looks like? They've obviously not had particularly great form since David Gray's come in. They, they got a win at St Mirren um, the week past Saturday. Pretty disappointed defeat from at Livingston at the weekend. Uh, that, that game could be anything. Who knows? I mean, it's two teams who've got really nothing really to play for, I don't think, at this point now. So it's either going to be a high-scoring affair with two teams just, you know, let loose, or it could be a drab nil-nil. Who knows? St. Johnston away, again, who knows what that looks like now going, going forward, depending on the results at the weekend. That could be a St. Johnston side who are already consigned to the playoff yeah. spot. I think they probably yeah. are now anyway, but mathematically they could be consigned to it at the weekend. Again, does that mean then that Callum Davidson takes a few of his first teamers out of the fighting line for a playoff? It could be just a bunch of kids at St Johnston. Who really knows? And then yeah, similar at the end of the season could be a, a typical dead rubber thing. It's not it's not exactly three fixtures right now that fills you with a lot of enthusiasm. It's gonna be much good football. But at the same time, maybe we could see the shackles come off and a bit of confidence being built potentially in amongst our team and try and go into the summer window with a bit of a bounce. Yeah. All right, mate. Fantastic as always. Thank you so much for your time. And um, I'll catch up with you very soon. Not a problem. Cheers, Ali. Really, mate. Regards to the other lads. There we go, Gary from ABZ Podcast. If you want to give the guys a follow on social media, please do. They've always got fantastic content. Lots of interviews on there with former ex-Aberdeen players. They'll be bringing out a fresh podcast very soon. In the meantime, they have an excellent one out at the moment with Gothenburg hero John Hewitt. Now, the plan here on AB on ABZ on ABTV is to try and bring you as much original content as I possibly can going forward about Aberdeen Football Club and football in general. Look out for special one-on-one -on -one Zoom interviews, which will sort of not replace the written blogs, but we want to move that going forward. So look out on my social media pages for all that information. In the meantime, I was sent this fantastic photograph by Andy Dornan. Here are a number of ex Aberdeen players enjoying a day out on Sunday. Jim Layton, Stephen Glass was there. Great to see Stephen there. Andy Considine with his dad, Doug. John Hewitt, Andy Dornan, Wee Joe, Willie Garner. Willie Miller was there. Bobby Clark was there as well. Johnny Hayes, he enjoyed a great day out as well. And I know somebody who really enjoyed their day was Joe Harper. <laughs> Look at wee Joe. Now, you have to trust me, he is dancing to music here. Obviously, due to copyright, I cannot bring you the music, but they are dancing away. Look how much fun he's having. Brilliant to see Joe looking so well. There you go. Joe Harper. Now, today is a very special day in the Aberdeen Football Club calendar. 
42 years ago this very day, we won the league title for only our second time in our history, the first time since 1954-55. Now, when the pandemic hit a couple of years ago, I jumped on a number of Zoom interviews with a host of ex-Aberdeen players, and I specifically spoke to Willie Miller about that very special day. So, here is God himself chewing the fat about that wonderful day 42 years ago. Enjoy. Hi there. Welcome to what is the first of what I'm hoping will be many Zoom interviews with ex Aberdeen players over the coming weeks and months. And as we know, today is the 40th anniversary of Aberdeen winning the league title at Easter Road in season 1979 and 1980. And I thought it'd be quite apt to talk to my very own hero for my first production. Delighted to say Willie Miller is here. Hiya, Willie. Ali, you all right? Yeah, I'm very well. Lovely to see you. Thank you for coming on. Can you believe it's been 40 years? Not really. You know, I think, uh, <laughs> you know, when you get to my age, though, you look back and uh, you can't believe how quickly the years have uh, flashed by. But unfortunately, it's just a fact of life that it's uh, been a, a, a lot of years uh, since we lifted that trophy. A very important trophy for us, of course. Uh, but it just seems like yesterday. Mm. Let's just go back just before the game, because Willie and I are going to talk specifically about the game at Easter Road. But when did you start to get an inkling that the league title could possibly be ours? Well, you know, it was always, um, <coughs> it was always a target. Um, I came to the club in 71. Um, so, you know, it's a good nine years of uh, trying. Um, Bobby Clark was there before me. He was the old stager. And of course, he had a great belief that it uh, was achievable. But I don't think anybody else really felt it was achievable outside the club and uh, the manager and, and the players. Uh, I, I think probably the fans had their doubts as well, particularly uh, when Morley drew with the uh, Hibs. It was really strange how, you know, one of the most depressing games that season was Hibs at Petaudry and one of the best games was obviously the second last game when we actually clinched the title. Uh, but no, we had a belief. We had a belief that uh, we could do it. And uh, I, I think it's it's probably um, the two games against Celtic. And, you know, we had that challenge down at Celtic Park where we had to go down there and beat them twice. Uh, quite an extraordinary um, target for us, but one that we managed to achieve. And I think, you know, once we uh, took care of Celtic, who were closest, well, they were leading the, the, the league for most of the season. Uh, but once we took them on at Celtic Park and, and, and took them over, then, uh, you know, the, we believed the title was ours. We just needed to see it over the line. See, from March 1980 to the end of the season, there was actually a fixture congestion. And there was a backlog of games that had to be played because of our commitments in the, the various cup competitions. And I worked yeah. out that nearly every week, for a number of weeks, we had to play two, if not three, games a week. Do you think that consistency actually helped us towards the end of the season? Because we went a number of games unbeaten. Yeah. Yeah, possibly. I mean, it helped me because uh, it was great. We didn't have to do too much training. <laughs> and training was not uh, my strong point. Uh, I loved the games. I loved playing the games. and Obviously, I enjoyed uh, when the ball was out in training. But the rest, to be perfectly honest, was uh, just a means to an end. Um, yeah, we had that uh, backlog. We had a lot of games to make up. with a lot of points behind as well, you know, uh, at the beginning of the year. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, if, if the games come thick and fast, you don't have too much time to think about it. You know, you don't have to go into the tactics too much. We're a very good side with a lot of players, with a lot of belief, very talented players. Um, you know, so I, I think that definitely helped. It helped the momentum. Um, and it helped just with the fact that the games kept, kept, kept coming at us and we knew that we just had to keep rolling along and, and getting the results and getting the victories and stacking up the points. And, 
just trying to put that pressure on uh, Celtic until we could take them on. And you know, there's always pivotal games uh, in the season. And, uh, when you're chasing someone um, like Celtic as well, who are a very good side, who were used to winning titles, um, then you just had to get them in your sight to give you the opportunity to take them. Um, but I, I do think, yeah, the fact that it was uh, a congested uh, period that, that it helped us and it certainly helped the consistency. Right, let's talk about the game at Easter Road. Were you nervous ahead of that game? Nervous ahead of which game? Sorry, I lost you there for a minute, Alec. The Hibs game at Easter Road where we clinched it. Were you nervous ahead of that game? Yeah. No, I, I don't think so. Um, you know, I, I cannot remember going into that game feeling nervous. Um, and, and certainly the way it panned out, it was quite a romp for us. Uh, but, you know, it's after you have taken on, you had taken on Celtic, after you had beaten them twice at Celtic Park, it's after you had achieved something that nobody thought, nobody thought that was possible to go to Celtic in space, Celtic Park, East End of Glasgow, where I came from, by the way. Um, and, and take Celtic on and, and, and not just compete with them, but, you know, actually beat them and beat them well. Uh, and I think that gave us a belief. So you, you take that forward, you take that confidence into the game at Easter Road. And, you know, the feeling was that we're not going to let it slip this time. Uh, we're not going to um, allow Celtic uh, any kind of a glimmer of hope. And we just had to you know, do the job, do the business on the day, and uh, and we did. We did that extremely well. Can you recall what Sir Alex Ferguson said ahead of kickoff in the dressing room? I can't remember the exact words, but it was it was actually quite a um, quite an intense person, as you know, <laughs> or you've probably <laughs> read and heard and you know listened to the stories and uh, over the years. Um, and, and, and it was intense. And had this constant cough as well, this nervous cough that he had too. Uh, great manager, absolutely. Had us all prepared, you know, had us all wound up. Um, but there was a, a belief within the dressing room, you know, sometimes I felt that the manager could go over the top, but we stayed calm. You know, the majority of the players stayed calm. We knew what it was like. Uh, we knew the intensity. We knew that the target that he had was... To, to dominate Scottish football. The only way you can dominate Scottish football is take on the old firm. Um, so the work was done. Uh, the, the, the confidence was there. Um, he just had to make sure that we didn't leave anything in the dressing room. So, you know, nothing too intense, you know, nothing too uh, overwhelming in terms of, of tactics. You know, the games have been coming thick and fast. So we knew that we were in a good vein of thought. And uh, it was just a matter of keeping us focused. So I, I didn't really feel nervous, and I don't think a lot of the boys felt nervous either. The opening goal came on the 23rd minute, Stevie Archibald's header. Um, but did you sense that the goal was coming anyway, just by the way that we'd started the game? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you know, when I'm saying that we weren't nervous in the dressing room, I don't think we were. But once you got onto the field of play, you've still got to do the business, you've still got to cope with what's ahead of you and the uh, uh, importance of this game. And and sometimes that can affect your play. And, and, you know, perhaps we weren't at our very best, but as I said, I think we had that resolve and that confidence, that belief uh, that eventually the goals would come. And, and they did, you know, start coming then. Uh, there was only always going to be one winner, uh, and that was going to be us. And, you know, after the first goal, goal it was a bit of a wrong. Uh, thereafter, I didn't feel that I had too much to do at the back. That Bobby Clark had too much to do at the back. Just a matter of keeping things focused and not doing anything silly, and uh, allowing the most talented players, uh, like Sir Gordon Track, like Sir Stuart Kennedy, um, who was, you know, phenomenal in the both Celtic games and the Hibs game. Uh, you know, Ian Scanlon as well, and McGee and Archibald. Not a, not a bad day. Uh, you know, striking partnership to rely on. So, no, but I was pretty confident that, that these guys would uh, do the business and I just had to keep it nice and calm and organised at the back. 2 at half-time. I'm guessing not much was said during at half-time. Did anything have to be said? Well, nothing really had to be said, but 
you know, I'm sure the manager was uh, was pointing out various things. Um, I was speaking to, as you can imagine, I, I spoke to a number of people this week about the uh, the 40th anniversary, and one of the reporters was telling me that on the day, listen to this one, on the day, Alec Ferguson had a run-in with Brian McGinley, who was, I think, the referee, uh, or the linesman, I'm not sure, but he had given Hibbs uh, a throw-in, and Alec Ferguson had a run-in with him, and Alec Ferguson actually get banned for the next season, or a fair part of the next season, uh, the start of the next season, over over a throw in, you know, and I think that's how intense a manager could get at times. Uh, and I'm sure that, you know, he was pointing out various things at, uh, at half time, but I, again, it's just keeping myself focused. You know, you, you, I mean, let's face it, we didn't lose a lot of goals in these days. It was, you know, we're, we're pretty watertight defensively. Um, so the likelihood of any kind of a collapse in the second half was pretty small. In the second half, I have to ask you. Did at any time you inquire about how Celtic were getting on at Love Street? Well, we didn't have to because we were being told. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we knew we, we had won that game at a certain point. You know, once you know the third goal goes in, there's no way back for them. And it's only a matter of time. But, yeah, I mean, towards the end, it was, it was Bobby Clark. The fans were telling Bobby Clark. And obviously, the manager was... Uh, being told as well what was going on, and we knew by the, the the kind of atmosphere in the ground. Not only were we doing well, but Celtic were not doing as well as uh, they had hoped. Uh, and and we did know that they were drawing at that time. And Clarkey was keeping me right as well. Um, but it wasn't really because you, you've still got to focus. You've still got a job in hand to do. So you, you can't get you, you know too involved with what the opposition are doing. But in that day, towards the end of the game, we certainly knew that you know Celtic were drawing, and it was just a matter of uh, time before we could find out whether they had drawn or whether they had managed to turn that game round and, and, and take it to the last game of the season. Um, so yes, it, it's one of the, the the few games that I think you were actually um, kind of listening out for the opposition result because normally you would just put it behind you, but. Towards the end of that game, definitely, that was that was important uh, to us. There was only a, a few seconds between full-time in our game and then full-time at Love Street. I, I know it's 40 years ago, Willie, so forgive me, the, forgive the question, but can you remember who you were standing next to when you actually got the news that we'd won the league? And can you remember your emotion? It was Clarky, yeah, Bobby Clark. Um, you know, I was normally the closest to him anyway. I, I played that deep. <laughs> so and and he was keeping his right and he 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 was getting the scores and you know he's uh, one of the most positive guys that I've ever met in my life as well so uh, it was him and uh, the the emotion was kind of overwhelming at the time uh, we had a cuddle and then there he did his dance onto the pitch and grabbed Clarkie and grabbed me uh, you know at the same time and we, we hugged each other uh, we knew the importance of it it was. Uh, a milestone for the club, uh, for the manager, for everybody involved. And it was just a, a great afternoon. So the emotions were high uh, because <coughs> it was something we'd strived to do for such a long time. Uh, and and for me, Bobby Clark uh, deserved it more than anyone said. because he had been at the club the longest. Yeah. He was the one that always believed that it could, uh, it could happen. Um, you know, he was very helpful to me as a as a young player as well, breaking into the first team. He also developed a lot of that team slightly later, going into 82 and 83, Coopers, Simpsons, you know, him and Lenny Taylor worked tirelessly to develop, uh, you know, Ryan Gunn, Eric Black, John Hewitt, okay, Doogie, you know, maybe not Doogie Bell, Doogie uh, came from, uh, Doogie came from St. Mirren right enough, but, you know, that, that, these young players were very good with, uh, and, and for me, he deserved it more than more than anybody because he was a big part of the belief, along with the manager, uh, that we could actually do it. Over the years, have you had some fun with Sir Alex over that celebration whenever you guys have met up? Yeah, but, I mean, we don't meet up too often. It's, it's, 
pretty sporadic and you know everybody knows what a career that uh, he went on to have at Manchester United but yeah we have met up and we have had uh, a laugh and a joke about that and many other things as well uh, I think when you get together as a group um, you know and you start talking about specific instances uh, there's some players within that group that get great memories almost photographic memories um, I'm, I'm not one of them, but when they start talking about it, when they start, you know, speaking about incidents, uh, you know, little ones or big ones or funny ones or depressing ones, we had a few depressing chats from the manager as well. Um, then it brings it, it brings it all back, and certainly um, Sir Alex Ferguson has got a very good memory on uh, what happened in the past as well, and uh, yeah. When we get together on the other occasion we do get together then it's a, it's good fun to recall these uh, exciting and momentous moments if you were to pick a goal from all the goals that we scored at easter road what was your personal favorite all the goals that we scored at easter road yeah well i, I think scanlon's one on the day uh was was my favorite i, I thought scanlon was brilliant on the day as well uh, he got the two goals I mean, McGee and Archibald were brilliant as well, or B. Gordon, Stuart Kennedy. I mean, it was a great team performance, but I think that goal, uh, you know, just kind of a rammed at home that, uh, that, that the title was going to be ours. Um, and it was a magnificent goal as well. You know, he really drilled it into the back of the net. So I would say that one. Of course, if you were asking me what my own personal best goal had to be against Celtic at Petodre. Uh, and 86, a few years later, when we, when we won the title uh, that year as well. Because I don't normally score goals. Uh, scored one or two good ones, but none more important than that one. Uh, but the, the, the Easter Road, that, that definitely is uh, the most memorable goal uh, when I've played there. Yeah. One last question for you. How much fun was the bus journey home from Edinburgh back to Aberdeen after you clinched the league? You, you know what? Yeah, it was it was it was more one of satisfaction uh, than celebration because remember we still had a job to do. Obviously, we celebrated, but um, and we knew well the title was ours because Party Thistle I think had to beat us ten nil, something silly like that. Um, but you're still professional. You've still got to prepare for that game in the midweek. Um, so it was. Uh, we celebrated it. We celebrated it quite noisily, but we celebrated it knowing that we still had a game to, to play. Um, and, you know, we would eventually get the trophy and take it back to Petodre and then we could really celebrate. Uh, so it was, uh, it was a bus full of very happy players, very satisfied players. And a manager that, uh, that you know, his, his target was met that day. Uh, that was the start of it. He knew that he had to overcome Rangers and Celtic. He knew that title wins were vital because it didn't happen to clubs like uh, Aberdeen. That was the territory of Rangers and Celtic. So I think from that moment on, we had the belief that we could do something. We did something really special that day, but there was more to be achieved and uh, really special occasions were achieved between then and, uh, and what, 86. You know, just a phenomenal, phenomenal time for the club. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming on and, and talking to me today. So um, stay safe, stay healthy in these uncertain times and enjoy the celebration anniversary because uh, it was, it really was something else. So thank you. Thank you. Lovely to see you. We'll, we'll enjoy it when we come out of this nonsense. <laughs> Lovely to see you. There we go, God himself, Willie Miller, who celebrated his 67th birthday yesterday, looking back on Aberdeen's league title winning game against Hibs 42 years ago this very day. Okay, we're just about done, but just let me say thank you to my sponsors, Lux Scott. If you're looking for a luxury minibus company to travel to an event, a wedding, a game, whatever it may be, check them out on site online their buses are absolutely fantastic 
the way to travel, luxury, absolutely wonderful. And to my long-term sponsor, Saltai Energy, who continue to lead the way in the oil industry in the, the Northeast and beyond. Guys, thank you so much for being with me today. I hope you've enjoyed the show and I will see you very soon. Keep an eye on my social media channels for the next program. Take care. Bye for now.